Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, Larry Charles Jr. presentation. He is a senior level designer and he has a lot of industry experience that he wants to share with you. Um, you probably don't see me, but my name is Monica Capiello and I am an instructor at the multimedia department at Ohlone College. And with that being said, I'm handing it off to Larry Charles. Welcome, Larry. Monica, thank you so much for having me. To everyone at the Ohlone College, all students and staff, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to the next generation of game developers and game designers. And just so you know, I actually got a promotion in the last 15 seconds. Uh, I just was promoted to lead level designer uh, to let everyone know, uh, no longer senior. <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, it was just, I'm just correcting a mistake with a terrible joke. Monica, thank you for introducing me and I'm so happy to be here. Um, to everybody in the audience today, we're gonna talk about a couple of things. First, I'm gonna start with a little bit about what I do to kind of give you guys a little bit of insight into my process and how my creative thinking got me to this point. But then I wanted to kind of do curated Q&A after that, where we get to talk about experiences, anything that I can offer as a minority or to, you know, technically a big athlete type person who found his way into the game industry, what that must have been like. Any little piece of nugget of information that I can offer you guys, I am an open book resource. So the second half of the presentation will be devoted to that. Uh, and without further ado, Sam, I will speak slow, but you seem like you, you've got this. so. You know what I mean? I, I trust you uh, and I, I appreciate you being here to make sure that this message can be spread to everyone. Uh, so this is awesome. This is, this is great. So let me start with my little presentation. Give me a second. And I need to go back to Zoom and share my screen. While Larry does that, I would like to um, ask you guys that if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat. Um, and we can, we're gonna be constantly checking the chat for questions. Okay, so hopefully everyone sees a big blue screen that says level design, <laughs> uh, a thumbs up. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so here we go. Uh, again, I'm a lead level designer at a company called Striking Distance Studios where all my colleagues, coworkers and friends are hard at work on a game called the Callisto Protocol. And so I'm taking some time away from that to deliver this information to you guys today. So also, you know, thanks to my company. Here we go. Level design, what is it that I do over here? Well, let's first break down what I call a level. For me, a level is a stage or a specific section or slice of an entire game experience designed for a player to explore and progress through. So now that we know what a level is or have at least some sort of common understanding, here's what I'm saying I do as a level designer. My role is to come up with and implement the ideas for gameplay experiences that collaborates with all the departments by using the art, the animations, the systems, mechanics, weapons, challenges, anything to basically mix it all together to make sure that I deliver a challenging but fun level experience for a player playing my game. And most importantly, this is something that I love to say is that good level design helps to set up and protect the immersion and really just deliver the fantasy. So when I'm doing what I do, I usually start with the high concept. And the high concept of this, it's the overall experience summarized into maybe one or two pieces of unique gameplay or, or something cool or specific about a scenario. And when I have my high concept, I said, I'm gonna be sure to swing for the fences, but stay within the design goals of my game and the constraints of my story uh, and respect your pillars. So before I move on, I would like to address the audience. I'm particularly known for doing single player level design in story games or in action games where you are a protagonist who's going through an experience usually related to the hero's journey. Um, I have done multiplayer designs, but most of what I'm talking about today is in reference to doing single player kind of content story driven uh, game design and game experiences. So with that out of the way, let's, uh, I'm gonna share a couple of examples of what I mean by a, a good high concept for a level. So high concept number one, the lost desert. You're escaping your kidnappers to find yourself wandering the dangerous desert sands at nighttime, right? Another high concept, blend in. You need to steal the Mona Lisa right in the middle of a museum's anniversary celebration. And number three, hide and seek. You are tracking your assassination target through crowded city streets, trying to take them out without being spotted. Now, each one of these high concepts actually comes from a known game development franchise that I'm just using as an example to help sell the understanding of what a high concept is. The Lost Desert could be something that you would experience in maybe uh, a Tomb Raider type game 
where you've been kidnapped and you are wandering a, a very vast and open space that is not a cityscape. It's somewhere adventurous, uh, blend in, something that is more like stealing the Mona Lisa right in the middle of the museum. This is something I kind of leaned into like a hitman style gameplay where you are using the crowd, you're, you're you know, walking through this area, you have to do something incredibly dangerous, incredibly public, and how you figure out how to avoid that. And then lastly, you know, it could also be Hitman, but I was thinking of Assassin's Creed here, where you're tracking an assassination target through city streets and you need to take them out without being spotted. So after I get my high concept, I go into my brainstorming. It's like, okay, so I know that I'm gonna have a level that's at night and I'm gonna be running from a threat and I have a vehicle, right? But I, I then need to think of like, what are all the key moments? What are all the cool things that I think could be fun to do? And so I don't just pull it out of my bum. Usually I start with a Google image search. Uh, I'll find any and all images that may inspire ideas related to the location or scenario. And then I'll combine them, or excuse me, I'll compile them and look over them while brainstorming. So I like to, to feed my imagination with, hey, if I know my level is gonna take place in Arkansas, well, what iconic things in Arkansas uh, happen? What does it look like during the night? What does it look like during the day? What does it look like when it's raining there? Um, what are some cool locations that look like a great place for a good dust up between our main character and his, uh, his main anti-hero, our antagonist, excuse me. Next, I keep the ideas that help me achieve the ideals that may also show off some killer gameplay and design moments that help generate commercial appeal. So going back to stealing the Mona Lisa in the middle of the daytime, um, I probably would not save any images of pirate ship combat or, you know, um, something that's unrelated to like stealthing my way through a museum. So, but I might say, what does a museum look like on the inside or a specific museum? What does the security in a museum look like? What kinds of things do I think need to be in that experience? So I go looking for reference to help me paint a picture in my own head of what that environment needs to look like and feel like before I start designing it. And then finally, I just compile a list of the events, moments, objectives, and ideals that I think will, good, re will represent my final experience. And this is before I even address my story and before I address my gameplay. I was like, you know what would be fun? When you grab the painting, an alarm goes off and now you have to run. Like I'm not even thinking in context of the whole experience. I'm just thinking of these are like 10 to 12 cool things that could happen in the level that I'm gonna be working on. So now I've got all the cool stuff. I have my story. I know where it's gonna take place. I know what I'm going for. So now it's time for me to sew them together into level beats. So I start with a beat sheet. It's a paper document that lists each level moment that I'm designing in order. Uh, the light, uh, nothing more, nothing less. So I'm really just detailing the player does this, then the player does this, the player sees this, then this happens, and then the player gets this, and then this happens. And after that, the player goes here, the player does this. It's simply just a list of the events that are gonna be experienced by the player. They have to be in order though. So now I'm trying to get wrap my mind around what is the start to finish experience of going to the museum, stealing the Mona Lisa and getting out before the Paris police can get me. After I have my level beats, I then put together a beat diagram. And this is pretty simple. It's a graphic representation of the physical location of each event on the beat sheet. And then I say roughly to scale meaning I'll draw an image of a circle or just I'm just quickly diagramming on a blank piece of paper the direction of the flow of events, but then roughly kind of plotting out about how much space I think I'm going to need to pull off that event because that helps start to put together the skeleton of my level design. And so we're going to go into what that means. This last thing, the two minute rule. Uh, this is something that I follow when I'm doing any big budget level designing for games is a good benchmark for designing commercial levels or even demo levels uh, will be changing beats roughly every two minutes. You want the player to see what they're doing, engage with it, experience it, and then move on to the next beat, usually about within two minutes. If you're going five, six, seven minutes into a beat, it's gonna get stale. Uh, maybe it's too difficult, that's also another opinion, but usually you want, the, you want to pull the player's excitement and roughly two minutes is about the mark that I go for on average, plus or minus. Like it could be a minute 30, it could be two minutes and 40, it could even be a minute 10, but I'm usually within that window. So here's just a quick example of like what my level beats might look like. And this is talking about an opening sequence. 
and you really see like I'm just describing what the player will see with, with I'm not worried about how much it costs I'm not worried about what art I need or what's involved I'm literally just writing down if I get my way this is what the player will experience boom pitch black screen sounds of a train chugging along little bumps and bits heard clinging against the windows rattlings etc shafts of light quickly flash by the screen to promote the idea of movement visually first horn company promo logo in white a black lotus production return to pitch black darkness and continue it's like i'm literally breaking down moment by moment what's supposed to happen uh and then as you see at the bottom it says start gameplay so clearly that's where the player gets control and then they start the game so now let me give a better example though of what my you guys can laugh but like this is what a beat diagram starts to look like for me is where I'll have an initial location. I, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse pointer. Can you or no? Oh, okay, cool. So like here you'll have, here's where an experience may start and I'm um, leading into an area that's roughly to scale about this size. This may be a combat, this may be an explore, exploration space. When you find your key element, it's like, okay, cool. Now you're going through a hallway or a corridor with a companion. Maybe you're talking about the experience you just have. You move on to the next beat, oh my God, Who's that ahead? Why are they near the car that we're supposed to be our getaway vehicle? You get to that point, boom, your car is gone and now you're stuck and the police are there and you have the Mona Lisa in hand. You find that your handler has a boat waiting for you. You get to the boat. Now you're driving through the, just on a boat, just trying to get away from all this police. Obviously this is gonna take a whole lot more space and you have a couple of extra beats. This literally is, laugh if you want, I promise you, I use this to this day. I diagram space by space with whatever it feels like roughly the amount of space that I'll need, because now I can look at this and say, okay, I'm gonna start left, I'm gonna progress right. Where are my areas where I might retraverse a space? So like clearly you see here, I'm gonna to come to this space, I'm gonna exit and do two bits of gameplay, and then I intend on coming back and ending the level here. Like I can see all this and plot all this out before I ask an artist to build this for me, before I ask for engineering support, before I ask for anything else, I can, throw away this cheap drawing if I don't feel like this works. And you can save millions of dollars on a big game project if you're thorough, if you plot out your space, if you plot out what you're trying to do. And so I keep it simple. I'm not trying to impress anyone here. I'm just trying to look at something that feels like, this feels like a good progression. It feels like a good amount of space. I'm using the space properly and I'm proud of this. Okay, now I'll do a 2D drawing on top of this, which would actually be something that I care about. Um, I'm actually going to speed this up a little bit. Uh, so next, everyone's familiar, hopefully, with a blockout. A blockout is I would take the 2D version of my beat diagram, and I would say, like, all right, let me actually start drawing that space. What does the marketplace look like? What does that hotel look like? What does the Louvre look like on the inside? What are those paths based on the flow from the beat diagram? I take that to come into the blockout stage. And I wanted to share just a couple of notes on what I do for blockouts. So again, the blockout is from 2D to 3D. I'm using my beat diagram to help serve as a blueprint for my basic blockout of geometry. Uh, I'm planning here for my Hista, for my vistas or hero shots. And you know, if you're making a big budget game, there's a lot of beautiful art that goes into it. There's a lot of cinematic moments that you wanna try to show off and you have to build that into your design. So I need to be thinking ahead in regards to selling my level with, here's where the player is standing when the police come across the street, they show up with a rocket launcher and one of the rockets misses and it just blows up a whole half a building. But luckily they miss because now I have an escape route. But if I look down there, I'll see the coastline, I'll see a cliff and I'll see this grand view of where I am in Paris, France at the time. You have to plan that into your design. And so you need to know well ahead of time how to orchestrate those events to therefore know where the best locations for these beautiful vistas will be. Uh, and then last, simple forms. Again, I'm just building the skeleton for my environment team. I'm using simple shapes to keep in mind the space that I want in gameplay, not necessarily the final look. I, I've been beneficial enough to not work for companies that require me to actually do the level building more so than just blocking out my space. So like I can drop a box and say, this is a skyscraper. And I can make a room and say, this is a tunnel in a basement. And real artists save my butt and come through and actually replace my block with a real looking skyscraper or replace my box with a real looking hallway with lighting, et cetera. And that's just great for me because I have never once been paid for my art in my life. So good on that. 
Uh, okay, so last, we'll just get into, obviously, the good bits, which is the layouts and gameplay. This is uh, actually scenes from a level that I had built uh, in the past for a personal project in outer space. So after I get my initial block out, I go from 3D to better 3D. Usually an environment art team would take over from here. This is where we start worrying about things like structural integrity, where we want to build believable art and make sure that we have the proper supports and designs to make sure that the space has enough space, but it makes enough sense. If I had a huge warehouse with no columns to support the roof, that does not make sense. If you go to any warehouse, you see ribbing under the ceiling, you see columns, you see support, you see walls that are load bearing. Like these are things that you need to know as a designer, you know, you should study a little bit of architecture so that you don't just build this space like, hey, this is my castle. And you walk in the castle and people are like, this is like no castle I've ever been in because you didn't understand what makes a castle a castle, not just the fantasy elements of it looking cool, but like why things are built certain ways in castles, like why archways will have a keystone at the top and why you'll always see the archways kind of looking that way because of the fact that the keystone is holding the rest of the blocks in place that form that archway. It's not just an aesthetic choice that actually is how it works. Uh, so that's kind of something that you would need to know. And so I'm paying attention to those kinds of things at this point is suspension of disbelief, but also making sure that I'm maintaining structural integrity. I don't have inch thick walls. I have 10 inch thick walls or, or you know, a foot and a half thick walls, depending on what type of building you're in, what type of materials I'm trying to tell you to pretend lives in that, in that wall. Uh, and then last, I'm communicating my storytelling here. Environments need to feel lived in. I don't make environments that are just Ikea clean all the way through. If I'm walking into a kitchen, how do I tell the player that not only is this a kitchen, but people actually lived in here? I put little crumbs of bagel dust by the toaster and I, I, I move dishes around. Some of the dishes are dirty, some are clean. Everywhere where there's a chair, I look near the chair, there's scuff marks on the ground from where chairs get used the most. Like I go to this level of detail in regards to telling the player that they're in an environment that people lived in, that people participate in you should be able to see little bits of storytelling in these environments. So I'm a huge stickler for this. So at this stage of my design, I already know my gameplay events are going to be where, I know what the player is going to go through and see, but I create the stories and the vignettes for each room. And I'll tell my art team, like, here's what I need. Here's what I'm thinking. You know, this is some, so-and-so's bed. They're, they're never clean. So this bed specifically needs to be dirty. Uh, the boots and shoes need to be all over the place. Like that level of detail is important to me. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to stop this screen share. Kapam. So that, uh, unfortunately, I know that I wanted to split this presentation into two things, and I'm not actually doing a full-on workshop. So that kind of walks you through my process creatively in what I do as a designer. And what I'm hoping to kind of lead into now is conversation in regards to anything I can help you to do to become somebody who works in the game industry to get in, what difficulties I may have faced, um, what I would do if I was a student in 2021 about to go into the game industry. Um, now I would love to just do question answering and kind of be the professional that you guys can ask anything. I promise I'll give you the best answer I can that won't get me sued. Um, and I'll, I'll open up the door to some questions. Great, we already have a question in the chat and I'm just gonna All remind right. everybody to please feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, this is from Lenore and she's a counselor at Ohlone College and she has a lot of students that are interested in this field. Okay. And can you share your story and how you got in? Of course, um, well, this is a great story. I was about five, six years old. I wanted to be a doctor. I had all the Fisher Price doctor stuff. One day I was lucky enough to get a Nintendo for Christmas and that ruined all my plans of being anything other than related to game development. I, um, I moved to California in 2005 to go to the Art Institute of Orange County to learn video game development professionally. I'd spent a lot of time, you know, drawing comic books and, you know, making my own little games, like little small, stupid, like just small, terrible games that I will never share today. Um, but moving to California and going to college was the key. That was the start. I moved myself to where I knew in America most of the game development was happening and I got professional training to do it so that I could hopefully make that transition easy and it ended up working out. By me going to that school, I met Jim Rivers who ended up recruiting for Obsidian Entertainment and he ended up being one of the first people to help me get started working at Obsidian Entertainment, which was my first job in game development. 
Um, that's amazing. Right. You met a lot of really great people at uh, your Now, did you get in because of your perf uh, portfolio or did somebody else, one of your friends from Orange I'm County? Gonna, I'll be honest, <laughs> I, I can already tell you it's both. Um, mm -hmm. It is good to have a network of people who will pull for you, who will vouch for you, but they won't vouch for you if you're not good. No one puts their neck on the line for someone who's going to cause them problems or who's going to cause their friendships problems. Like I won't go to my friend and recommend someone who's a dud. Because now my friend is going to be mad at me and they're never going to listen to me when I say, hey, I've got somebody who could help you. So it does help to be someone who is valuable, who is talented, and then also who has a network that they can utilize to be like, hey, Jim, uh, good to see you, man. How you been? You, you hearing anything? I'm looking for a job. Oh, yeah, Larry, this guy that I know who's really good at what he does. Uh, I work for this company now and we would love to interview you for X, Y, Z position. That's how it works. Awesome. Uh, we have another question, which is what type of software do you uh, use to make your scenes? Oh, okay. So I'll talk about professionally and personally. Um, I use Unreal, I want to say almost exclusively, mainly because I've just used it the longest. I've been using it since high school, doing dumb maps when I was a kid. But Unreal has come a long way, and I've just kind of attached myself to that technology the most. Um, and so even on personal projects, I use Unreal. Uh, I use Maya for modeling and I use obviously Photoshop for any sort of intermediate stuff. I don't do a ton of art, but if I was going into art right now, I'd probably lean heavily into like maybe some Quixel tools, maybe some substance stuff to help make my models actually look legit. But for what I do as a designer, my, my trio right now is Unreal, Maya and Photoshop exclusively. Uh, I've had to use other engines professionally, like depending on what company you go to, they may not have Unreal. You may have to lose Unity. You may have to use Onyx or some sort of other custom in-house engine. And that's completely fine. If you give Michelangelo a paintbrush or a pencil, he'll still give you art. And that's the goal is to be at that level of confidence in yourself. That's fantastic. And just to let everybody know, if you're a student or a faculty member, you do get the opportunity to download Maya for free, Unreal for free, and Substance Painter for free. Photoshop, you have to pay. <laughs> Even you can't uh, get out of that. <laughs> I am familiar with Blender. So I see your comment. Uh, I, it just popped up. I'll just read it. It says, am I familiar with Blender at all? Yes, I am familiar. And I love what Blender is doing for the most part, being top level tools available for free mostly. I think there's like add-on stuff that you can buy or like microtrans stuff. Um, Blender kind of came along after I was like solidified in Maya. So I appreciate that Blender is a tool set that is free. And I think Blender is going to win out overall unless Maya and you know, uh, auto debt, what is that, Max, 3D Studio Max, figure out how to compete with a free market. Right now, they're not even trying, and Blender is just going to keep getting market share. Uh, that's how I see it working out. Absolutely. Uh, let's see, someone's asking about, let's see, modding, game modding, and level designing, but I think you already yeah. answered the software tools. Uh, Natalie has a question, which is, you mentioned learning architecture to make levels more believable. Mm -hmm. Are there other areas of knowledge that would help? Yes. So here, here's, here's how I feel about being a game designer. I think the more life you can experience and pay attention to, the better you will be creative, creatively as a level designer and game designer. You know, um, if I'm trying to create this world, this living, breathing world that you fall in love with and you don't question it, I have to know what makes a world believable. I have to know what makes it feel consistent, what makes it feel honest, what makes it feel like you trust that this is real that you don't like, what, there's an invisible wall here. There was no invisible wall anywhere else. When you run into moments like that, it pulls you out of the gaming experience. And now you're remembering like, oh, I'm playing a video game. So that's what saves me from like, that's why I would be interested in architecture because I don't want to build a building and you walk into it and say, wait, what? A building would never do this. Like, why is this roof this high? Why is, why is this an atrium and it's only one floor tall? Why is, why is this an elevator and only two people can fit in it? Every time you question why something feels wrong, I failed in creating an experience for you that takes you away from reality and makes you completely immersed in the experience that I've designed for you. So the more I can make believable, the more that I can trust, the more that I can build trust with you, the more that I can get you to fall in love with my environment without thinking about it, the better I'll be as a designer, in my opinion. And that takes a lot of knowledge. If I don't know NASCAR and I make a NASCAR game, anybody who loves NASCAR is gonna be like, what? That's not what happens when you go in the pit. Why is there a right turn? That's not what happens when you're in NASCAR. You know what I mean? Like you really need to know your stuff. And so the more stuff you know, the more stuff you can synthesize when making game development content. 
I'm going to follow up with that. So, you know, let's say you are going to be making that NASCAR game. How can you become somebody that can be trusted with that knowledge or you don't have any knowledge? Like, I know you look information in Google. Is there anything, anything else that you would recommend for somebody to do? Oh, I love, I love this question so much because I like saying what I'm about to say to everybody. This is 2021 and information is everywhere. It is conveniently accessible and it's darn near free for anything. You can go to YouTube and literally right now pretty much learn anything that you want. If I had to make a game on something completely unrelated to me, completely unbeknownst, I don't know, let me just pick something real quick. If I had to make the knitting game, I have so many resources to teach me about knitting. I have Facebook clubs where people who are knowledgeable about knitting are just freely sharing top level content that I can just be a member of the group and pick from like, oh, okay, so that's how you do that kind of stitch. How can I simulate that with a game or with control six? Oh, wow. So these are the common colors that people use for this type of thing. Like I'm totally pulling out my bum. But what I'm saying is information is out there, is readily available and is free, not just Google, not just YouTube, but meetup clubs, LinkedIn. There are experts who are offering their information for free via their Twitter, via masterclass, via anything. So research is key. If you haven't driven a car, you know, I don't know if you should make a NASCAR game. Like you should know what driving a car feels like because that's the experience that I'm supposed to be translating for the player. Like I need to know about a gear shift. I need to know about why you shift, when you shift. I need to know about friction with tires and surface because what happens when it rains, what happens when it doesn't rain. I need to have answers for that in my game in order for my game to be believable. So you need to go to all the level of details you can think of to just have information available. But lucky for you, you asked me this question today and not 40 years ago, where it was like, maybe get a book and take somebody's car out into the road and see. But like, you can learn everything you could possibly need to know about NASCAR from your chair uh, right now. So use the information that's out there and like fall in love with learning. Seriously, that will be your best aid as someone who wants to be any sort of creative. Just fall in love with learning and broadening your horizons. No more than you know every single day. I love that. And by the way, Larry uh, used to teach a, a couple of years ago, several years ago, actually. And one of the things that he said to a student once or to a group of a class was uh, you have no excuses. The knowledge is out there. No excuses. No excuses. <laughs> All right. So uh, another person's asking how competitive, how competitive is it to get into the industry after college? Ooh, you know, it's, it's interesting now. I think when I started, it was less competitive, but it was, it was still serious. Like I, I had to be good. And I think now, because we're looking at the globalization of talent, right? Like we already knew people were outsourcing jobs and that was a thing, but like, think about it now, everyone has worked from home. So literally the playing field is about as even as it can get. Your portfolio may be going up against somebody from Singapore or somebody from Canada or somebody from God knows where, for a job that is like down the street from you in California. The world and technology has just made the playing field so even that there is tons of information that is training people and tons of people available hungry for those entry level jobs. So I'll just be honest with you. I'm glad I graduated, you know, 15 years ago. What was it, 2000, 2007? Yeah, I'm glad I graduated in 07 versus now. It's not impossible. You still have advantages going to school now, but I'll say, the key is still the same key. Be as good as you possibly can and make it harder for competition to be better than you. You will rise to the top and be the person who receives the job. Like we want the best that we can get for as cheap as we can pay. And if you're the closest to the top, you've got more, more advantage than somebody who isn't. That's perfect. Um, let's see, we also have somebody asking, what was the first game you made? How old were you uh, when you made it? And what was it the game about? <laughs> Okay. Um, I mean, I, I came up being the person who would always like, whenever we would play like hide and go seek, I'm the guy who was like, oh, but let's turn out all the lights and make it even more scary. Or like, I was always doing little things to tweak games that we were already playing. Like I would always make up my own rules for like Uno or Monopoly or whatever. And I thought it was more fun, but I was probably just trying to make it easier for me to win. But my first legitimate, like my own game was a, a pen and paper RPG that I made uh, probably like 11 uh, and I made it because I spent a lot of time in my father's office near computers with no babysitter and I was bored. So, you know, I took my creativity and made what I liked the most, which is games. And so I, I made like a, a fantasy RPG that was probably terrible. <laughs> if I were to find it now, I'd have so many problems with the combat system, I'm sure. 
but yeah, that was uh, that was my first shot at actual game design, like start to finish. Was I did a pen and paper RPG? Didn't uh, so I just want to let everybody know I've known Larry for a while, but didn't you um, didn't you do a lot of like D and D as well when you were? Yeah, that's that's so that's yeah. pen and paper yeah. RPG Dungeons and yep. Dragons. Um, let's see. And do you feel that that helps you making game designs with when with that type of experience? Yeah, I think that the less you have, the better opportunity you have to need to be creative. Like if you only had three crayons and you wanted to make a masterpiece, you're going to have to figure out every angle and way you can use or make a mark with a crayon to get some variety out of it. I, I love designing with limitations because that's what I feel like I'm my most creative when you can have everything you don't try as hard. You just like, oh, just add this and just add that and just add this. You're not worried about the cohesion of all those ideas working together when you can just throw in whatever you want. So I personally have always enjoyed like limited scope and, you know, big needs. Uh, that's usually when you get the most juice out of the lemon, in my opinion. Just You consider it from all angles. You put way more effort into thinking about your medium, think about your platform. And you should be doing all that stuff anyway. But I just find when I have less to work with, I'm trying my best to go the absolute extra mile. Uh, I don't know why, but that's just kind of how it works out. Um, let's see. Al has a question. He says, can you please describe the relationship you need to have between a programmer and yourself uh, or like an environment artist? Sure. As a, what I will say, and because I've been hit or miss in regards to how I feel about going to school versus not going to school. I like it. There's pros and cons is, is the way that I'll frame it. But one of the pros, like to this day, I'll stand by it, is because of going through school and having scripting class and then drawing class and then modeling class and then animation class, even though I knew I just wanted to be a designer, it was a way of exposing me to workflows that I didn't think that I would need, but I now care about them very much so. Because when I'm talking to an animator, I can come to him with or her or them with problems solved already. Like, hey, in this last animation that we got, here are the things that I feel like were wrong. Maybe the, the frames were too long here, or maybe, you know, it does, I don't feel the weight when this person received the enemy getting thrown into them. Like I can actually, for better or worse, hopefully you have a good relationship with somebody who does a discipline that you don't do and you're about to critique. But if you can have a conversation without using new words, like you can speak the same language, as a designer, you go so much farther faster because I can just bust into the engineers and say, look guys, here's what I was thinking. I know that you're probably gonna set it up with this kind of physics model, but can we actually increase the mass because I need to fake it in such a way. Like knowing what you want to do and why you want it, when you go to somebody, they will respect you so much more than someone who just drops a turd on their plate and says, do your stuff. You know what I mean? Like being able to bridge that gap between being a designer who has to work with every department anyway, knowing their workflow, knowing what they do and knowing how they do it, you know, not maybe as, as in depth as they do, but at least having a general understanding of like applicable use of their discipline will take you so much farther and be trusted amongst your whole team. It's like the most invaluable skill that I could say I have right now is being able to communicate my ideas in seven different discipline languages. Um, let's see, Robert is asking, um, contrast to Samuel's question, as Samuel's question was about software, are there things, and Robert, you might need to clarify a little bit, but uh, are there things that people are good for this, but are actually aren't things that wouldn't you wouldn't recommend? So I'm going to kind of twist this and assume that it's about portfolio. So if you have a building a portfolio for like a company, what would you not recommend to add into it? And we're speaking from like trying to be a designer or just in general? Uh, let's just say designer. Yeah. Okay. All right, so to give myself some context so that I can give you a great answer, uh, I would know the company that I'm applying for because the company that I would be applying for is looking for somebody who can do the type of work that they want. So like if I was applying for Blizzard, they make a lot of games that are fantasy games or maybe Overwatch, you don't consider it as much fantasy, but you know, I'm, I'm creating a frame of reference to give this example. I wanna know what types of things that they value as a company, right? Like do they value a good sense of space? Do I feel like they are known for having the best combat design? Do I feel like their narrative design is just off the charts? Because I feel like different companies have their two or three things that they're just excellent at. And obviously they prioritize and they value that a lot. But also it just helps to know that you're going to a type of company with a portfolio that matches what they believe they can utilize you for. Uh, I would probably not show Blizzard my basketball game prototype. I would probably not show Blizzard, um, I don't know, like my my workday sim, 
you know, like job simulator type game. They, they may get a kick out of it. They may think it's cool or like, wow, this guy made his own game. That's great. But I personally would like, hey, I'm ready to be somebody implemented by your company's design team because look at all this content that I feel like is in the vein of what you're doing. And it gives them and you a more fair evaluation of your applicable talent because it's in the direction of what they're trying to hire. There's less guesswork for them to be like, okay, let me break down this basketball game and see what I feel like is good about this guy. You know, and and I'm not gonna lie, like sometimes the off the wall stuff does work for people, but it's you can't you can't bet on that with high um what's the word I'm looking for with like high return, I guess. Like I can't expect that to work 90% of the time. I would rather be 10% wrong and 90% right and say, look, know the company that you're going for, know what they do, know what they're good at, and know what they would want to see and have your portfolio ready to show them. So I, I use funny analogies and metaphors all the time. If I'm a company that builds cars and we don't have a steering wheel and I put out an advertisement that says, hi, we need a steering wheel. I don't want tires to show up, right? A tire, yes, it is round and cylindrical and it technically could work as a steering wheel, but I want, wow, look at that. That's a great steering wheel right there. It's solid. It's about the size that we need. It's got good foundation. Maybe we're just gonna change the paint a little bit, but we're gonna put this steering wheel in place. That's how I view hiring is they're looking for the right fit that's gonna immediately serve their goals that they need. It's not about you being like, oh, I'm just good at game design. They're gonna hire me. Like, nah, dude, they want a, they want a steering wheel. Are you the best steering wheel? You gotta be what they need. They'll hire you. That's really good advice. <laughs> uh, let's see, Talman is asking, you said areas need to feel lived. Uh, what is your thought process on accomplishing something like that? Okay, so my thought process is usually I'll start with what type of place it is, uh, like the world, not just the room, but like what kind of world is this? Is this a high conflict world? Is it a peaceful world? Is it a town? Is it a war zone? You know, like what, what are the top level environments that I'm worried about? Then I distill down to the like, okay, now who's in this room that I've built in this world? Is this a hotel for you know, adventurers or is this a hotel for travelers? Is this a hotel for tradesmen from a trade show or is this a hotel for down rotten scoundrel rogues, right? Like getting to that point really starts to paint a picture in regards to how I feel like this will feel lived in. Once I've gotten to that point, then it's usually very easy for me to start doing the environmental storytelling. Oh, here's where One-Eye McGee and Duke had their, their fight and you know that bard stool is still broken to this day. You know what I mean? Like stuff like that is very easy for me to come up with once I've built the framework that I'm trying to distill down to. So I usually start at a very high level and know the world, know the environment, and I know the conflicts that people may be dealing with to then say, now here is the micro slice of an environment with a micro slice of story that happened in that environment. That's awesome. Uh, let's see, we have a, a fun question. I think it's fun. Uh, being in the industry, how is your work schedule? Meaning, do you make your own hours or do you have to work a full shift every day? Ooh, so this, uh, <laughs> we're, we're starting to get to the sad part of game development. But <laughs> I'll just be honest, game mm -hmm. development where it's a hit driven industry and it's also project to project deadline driven. It's not, you can't on day one say, it's gonna take us exactly three years of 40 hours a week to get this game done. That's what you hope for. That's what everyone hopes for. No one goes into a game saying, here's where we crunch and here's how long we crunch on day one. We always try to plan against worst case scenario, but guess what? We're human and things happen in chaotic order. So therefore, the farther you extrapolate, the more chaos is present in your plan. So therefore you need to course correct. Is that work harder? Is that hire more people? Is that donate a Saturday or two? Is that maybe just be more efficient with your eight hours? There's many answers to that scenario. But what I will say in 2021, because we're kind of in COVID work from home era right now, being disciplined and being responsible for my time is of utmost importance because there's no one here to see if I'm slacking off. There's no one here to just give me that proximity, like, oh, I should be working. Like in a studio, when everyone is working, you probably don't slack off as much as you want. But I bet there's a lot of people working from home right now who are like, ah, no one can see that I'm gonna go to the kitchen real quick and make a sandwich. And that might turn into checking some email and maybe you might turn on the TV and that five minutes may have turned into 30 minutes. No one's there to see that. So I would say now it's imperative that you are on top of your schedule and doing the best that you can to be as efficient as you can. And it takes a lot of discipline because there's 
really is no one here to watch you except for when your meetings happen. So to wrap everything up, I do work a lot more than I would say if I was a banker or something that where like you can clearly just do a 40 hour a week job. Like when your build needs to be delivered tomorrow and it's not there yet, the work has to be done. When your deadline is two weeks away and it's not there yet, the work has to be done. Now, again, is it hiring people? Is it working harder? Again, there's many answers, but one way or another, your team has to be successful. And so usually you will end up finding times where it's just like, you know, I need to suck it up and get this work done. You know, take a vacation after the deadline, completely fine. But yeah, it's sometimes it does get very hard to continue to push forward, uh, especially if your company is just known for crunching and you're there and maybe they pay great, but there are companies that are just known for like, hey, you know what, look, we give you your whole salary as a check at the end of this. So stick it out, fella. Like, oh man, there's there's people out there who are in some pretty difficult work scenarios, you know, but the the work has to get done. That's that's just kind of how people feel, you know. It, it's not great, it's not good, it's not bad. It's just kind of how it is. Mm-hmm. That's 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 what I describe it. And I would say this applies to almost every entertainment industry. Uh, film has crazy hours. I've heard friends yeah. work 15 hours every single day, including weekends, because the, the, the film has to be done. Animation is the same way. Uh, Pixar automatically has 50 hours. You don't have a 40 hour week. You automatically start off with 50. So uh, I don't know about ILM. I mean, Nate can talk about ILM. Yep. 50 hour cool. work weeks mm-hmm. every, or every week, like mandatory. <laughs> So every That's company smart, has its own culture. So uh, you just have to find out what it is. But putting in the hours is pretty common. Uh, I want to address, I saw a comment. Excuse me, Monica. I uh, didn't mean to interrupt. But I just no wanted worries. to catch the comment. A comment popped up. I think it was Daniel Flores that says it sounds potentially exploitive. And I mean, potentially it is. Like, it let's is. just be honest. People know, like companies know, there's not a lot of companies that are always out for their employees' best interest. Let's just be real. I'm going to talk to you guys like adults. You know, some people never spent a day making a game themselves, but have spent a lot of time running a business and a lot of time, you know, putting pressure on and getting the results that they need so that they can produce X, Y, Z for shareholder meetings. There are companies like that. And then there are companies that are like, no, we are game developers and we care about this. And we too also have to crunch. Like, I don't think that in all cases it is exploitive. Sometimes it is like you're kind of at the bad end of a bad situation. Both happen. You know what I mean? It's, it's just on you as the individual to know what you're willing to go through in order to get something done. Because you can always quit. You know, you may be in a position where financially, Larry, I can't just quit. Well, like, let's be real. You can always quit. You're never forced to work anywhere, regardless of the situation that you're in. You are always making a decision to stay or not. Now, if you leave and your life becomes incredibly hard, like, yes, I understand that that's a reason why people won't quit or will try to stick something out but I never want people to forget their own power of control over their own life to be in control of if they decide to stay or decide to leave or decide to fight for change. Like you, you have so much more power than just, I have to stick this out or else I'll be broke. So I'm stuck here. Okay. Well, maybe how can I not be broke? Because now I don't have that pressure anymore. Now, like, you know, I've got some money saved up because I've saved money. I've changed how I spend now I'm not stuck in a shitty job, excuse my language, because I, you know, I'm not feeling that same fire that I felt earlier. You know, there's, you always have control of the decisions that you allow to have happen in your life. Um, yes, random events do happen and you will have to make moves, but I just, I really want to put it on you guys to let everyone here know you don't have to stand up. You don't have to sack, you don't have to suffer. You do not have to suffer. You can quit if a place is too hard or you feel like they're exploiting you. You have options. I know it gets difficult depending on each person's situation. I will not acknowledge that this isn't free, but I don't ever want anyone to ever forget their own power, that they have their own choice, that they can make, that they can control their situations as much as possible, at least. Um, I don't want you guys to forget that. I don't want you guys to just think that here's where I work and I'm stuck here and we're crunching and that's it. You don't have to accept that. And it's one of those things that if, if a lot of people keep leaving and they keep on recruiting, it actually costs a lot of money for companies to be hiring people. So yes. if that's the culture, it might actually change if people start leaving like a lot, like in large numbers. And All then, right, we're going to go back. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say one last thing. And there are more ways that, you know, the employee has power these days, like companies like Glassdoor and doing, you know, just kind of private review of places that people worked. Obviously, your own social network, like, hey, Larry, you work over there striking distance. What's it like? 
before you apply. You know, like you, there are subtle ways or small things that you can do to try to balance the scares a little more in your favor before you make a move. Uh, so don't forget that. But yes, we, we as developers do hold a lot of power. Just a lot of us don't think about using it. Um, so there, I'll say that to end my, my speech. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ken says, how critical are degree certificates? And can a person succeed on skill alone? And also, what is the, oh, of course, salary. What is the range of, of salary making in this field? Sure. So uh, three questions. So I'll, I'll try to break them down. And please remind me if after we get like 10 minutes in, I'm like, what was the other one? Uh, so <laughs> question number one, do you need a degree or not? The answer is no, you do not need a degree to be a game developer. You do need to be good. You do need to be talented and you do need to have hireable experiences. And so a degree helps you get those things faster than if you did it on your own. I will say that there is value to having a degree in game development, but it's not the barrier of entry. We, I don't, I haven't yet worked for a company that was like, oh, sorry, kid even though you've made, you're the best looking, you know, steering wheel that we've ever seen, you, you don't have that stamp that says you graduated, we can't hire you. Even though like you live down the street, a couple of people here know you, they vouch for you and you're very talented. We can clearly see, we're just not gonna hire you because you know, you didn't, you didn't graduate, you, you didn't have a degree. That's, that's we, we haven't reached that point in the industry. If you have a great portfolio, a great attitude, great work ethic, you can still get a job just like somebody who went to school and got a degree. So don't let getting a degree stop you or think that you won't be able to make it in. You will just have to make some sacrifices in other areas. Like you will need to be good. You may not have met a Jim Rivers like I did. You may not have met, you know, you may not have had the opportunity to study all the different disciplines that I did. You may not have had an opportunity to even have like guidance counseling or career service advisory or equipment available or software already paid for, right? Like there is value to getting a degree, but it's not an impossibility if you don't have it. Uh, that's that's the best way to break it down. And how about um, salary ranges? Oh, okay. That's so a big question. I'll, I'll be I'll happily tell everybody that my first job in the game industry was a forty thousand dollar a year salary offer for a junior level position. I would imagine I'm hoping that now like entry level is like fifty something like that. Maybe fifty five would be great. Uh, I'm hoping, and that's you know that's that's a hope. I haven't seen I haven't seen. Uh, the low level offers in a while, but uh, top level, like around my, my area right now, you could look at, you know, 130 to 160, 175, 180, uh, even at a non-known company. Like if you're like a, I don't know, like Sony Santa Monica or somewhere, you could even say like, oh, the lead level designer there might make 190, 200, 210. You start adding in bonuses for how well the game did and things like that, stock options. There, the top level is so much higher than I ever thought it would be I would say in the last 15 years than prior. Um, lead level designer, I don't know, in the year 2000 average, I would say, I don't know, maybe like 130. Um, but now you can, I mean, at the right company, the right product, you can, you can see considerable financial incentives. So it isn't even about just salary anymore. It's not the norm. Like not every company has stock options. Not every company has bonuses, but top level is, is getting closer to two than it is to one, I'll say. Uh, you're you're going to see a lot more people at the 150 to 200 mark uh, than ever before. Uh, all things considered, when you sum up everything, so I don't think you'll be broke if you go into game development and you're really good and you you make good connections and you make good games. Awesome. Um, all right, Gianni says, what steps would you take to get into the video game industry if you were a student in 2021? All right, I, I love this question. If I had to do it over again right now. I would be as public about what I can do as possible. I would probably have a YouTube channel uh, where once a week I'm showing off stuff that I'm doing, even if I'm just meeting other people who are my level and we're just working on stuff or collaborating, that's fine because people your level will get jobs too. And they may be like, you know, I know this Larry guy, let's, let's talk to him. So for starters, I would have some public forum for showing the progress of what I can do. Uh, I would also be on LinkedIn like a savage, like I would pick a day as my LinkedIn day to just look at a company and say like, okay, it's LinkedIn Thursday. I'm going to go and try to just introduce myself to two level designers at companies that I want to work for. And not just to meet them, but like, I'm looking for a relationship. I'm not looking for, hey, I'm connected now. And then we just both go away because that does nothing for you. I would be looking for like, hey, 
I'm someone who wants to work at your company and I believe my portfolio is in your direction. Do you mind just taking a look and maybe give me one or two pieces of advice? I bought all you guys products. I like, like let them know that like you have brought something to the table. You're not going to waste their time and keep trying. Cause a lot of people are going to be busy and will say no. But if you get someone who's in the industry who says yes, who's like, I will devote time as a professional to help you become a professional. That's invaluable. So I would have my LinkedIn Thursday. I would have my public forum for my work. And I would never, I would not stop working on my craft. Even when, if I got my first job, I would, I would sacrifice a lot of things to make sure that I just stay on a road of steady progression in my field. I'm studying master classes. I'm looking at other people's stuff. I'm buying games and trying to dissect them as well as enjoy them. Like you really need to immerse yourself in what you believe you want to do, because I promise you there's kids in Singapore right now that all they have to look forward to is when they get to do their art and all that they want to do is do their art or their design or their game development. And they don't even have the same amount of distractions that we do. And man, we're going to get left behind. You know what I mean? Like you, you have to put it on yourself to just be like, you know what, I'm just going to be as best as I can until I get my job. Like my focus is graduate, find a job. I'm networking on LinkedIn networking on YouTube, networking on Instagram, wherever I can be public, wherever I can put my stuff, I'm doing it. Something is going to come from that. You will find a relationship. You will find someone who takes interest in what you're doing or someone who will be like searching for, wow, we really need uh, badass skeleton warriors. And like, oh, I came across an art station post of this kid who does these really great skeletons. Let's talk to them. Let's see if they want to come. So yeah, that's what I would do. All right, guys, get that YouTube going. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm dead serious. Be, create some sort of public forum. Yeah, for I think it's do. a good idea because then you'll yeah. see your own progress. People can yeah. also see your own progress. It challenges you. It makes sure that you work on your own art every single yeah. week. Uh, yeah, I think that's going to keep, I think that's definitely going to help you grow. Uh, we are starting to run out of time and we have a lot of questions. So I'm unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get into um, uh, some of them, but I did wanted to touch base a little bit on, you know, something that's very uh that impacts everyone around us, which is, you know, you are a extremely creative and talented individual, but you are also, <laughs> um, you're also African-American and, and you're also extremely tall and extremely fit. So if you guys have <laughs> never met Larry, he's like really, really, I'm short. So everyone looks tall, but he's really tall and very fit. So can you touch on how does this feel like this has impacted your opportunities or anything like that in your path to where you are now? I'll say, I feel like I gave up career low hanging fruit for something very difficult. Um, being successful in the game industry is not free. It's not easy. And it's not for everyone. Um, I totally could have been a football player or any, that could have been so easy. Like, oh, just use what your, your God-given talents to do something that you already have an advantage in. I think in the creative industry, it's how good are you? Like it's brain and it's effort and everybody has those two things. It's way more competitive and you have to be a lot more honest with yourself in regards to your growth and how willing you are to sacrifice time in your life to get better. Um, I'll say as an African-American, I, I don't know. I, I'm from the East Coast, inner city, Connecticut. My opportunities at the time when I was a kid over there was not game development. I didn't even know that this was a thing. Uh, it took some, took some years and some exploration and some help on the internet to like get an understanding of the world beyond Hartford, Connecticut at the time. Uh, and so maybe there's a lot of people who can relate to that, but I will say it was hard to escape but once I did, you know, I just went full in. I was like, I'm going to put myself where I need to be. And I'm just going to dedicate myself to getting the results that I need in order to be successful here. Um, I definitely feel like an outsider still in a lot of ways. Like I haven't ever worked with another black designer. Um, and wait, let me think back. Just like the fact that I'm sitting here, like I have to recall every job to make sure that I'm telling the truth here. But I don't actually think I've ever been in the same room with another Black designer while I was a designer. Akil Hooper at Obsidian breaks that, but I was a producer and he was a designer. So he actually ends up being, that I recall, the only African-American designer that I ever worked with long-term at any job. I was always the only Black person. And that shouldn't matter. Like, let's just be honest. It should just be like, who cares if you're Black? Who cares where you come from? Everyone should be allowed to do this. And I agree, but there, you know, there are social things that kind of create barriers for you where like people hire who they like, people hire their friends, I do that all the time. And if you don't have a lot of friends or if a lot of people may be scared to talk to you or if you don't bridge a gap of communication, 
you, maybe you don't feel like the right candidate and you may get that response a lot more than other people may get. And so the only way you can overcome that is by being a better candidate, regardless of whatever barriers you feel like you may experience. And then you'll, you'll come to find that like, it's not scary. People will trust you. People will love working with you. Um, as long as you're good, as long as you're talented and whatever biases someone may have on day one, aren't there on day 100. It's unfortunate for me to say that like it, part of it is your responsibility to understand the playing field. Like I, I want to be an idealist and say, be yourself, be awesome and everything will work out. But we all know that, you know, as humans, there are things that humans do when they are comfortable and when they are uncomfortable. And sometimes those things don't work out in your favor. If you know that ahead of time, you can strategize against it uh, without getting too, you know, I want to stay PC and I want to, I want to be uplifting here. And I don't want to get into like the drudges of like suffering, but I will say that like, if you know what's real, just be honest, know what's real and strategize against what you feel like is holding you back. Have an answer, have a response, have a plan, you know, find allies, find support. And every time you find somebody who feels like they're on your side, you know, make sure that you appreciate them and like, like, Hey man, you know, you didn't have to stick out your neck for me. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Not only am I going to do the job, but I'm going to do it better because I know you were worried about hiring me. So let me just show you and show me that I'm the right fit. You know, sometimes you have to put in 1.5 to 2X compared to other people. And sometimes that's just how it is. Uh, it's worked so far. That's the best I got. That's wonderful, Larry. Thank you. Really appreciate that. And just to kind of end it in a positive note, <laughs> and I want to apologize to uh, everybody that left a question and we didn't get an answer to because we do have to respect Larry Charles's um, time. After all, he is, uh, you know, as you mentioned, as you guys noticed, he works a lot. But um, of all the games that you have created, do you have a favorite level? Ooh. Uh, yes, I do. Um... So I worked on a game. <laughs> I worked on a game a long time ago, Lost Planet Three, and the reason why I'm about to say that this part of the game was my favorite level was just because we were working with Capcom at the time, and Capcom would often bring out, you know, like Capcom associates to our studio to see what we were doing. And look, when I say limited budget, limited scope, limited everything, like that's where we were on this project. Like we didn't, we didn't have a lot left to to create amazing. And I was working on this boss fight where we were using these swarm enemies that kind of are just all over the place. And we had this radar that like kind of lets you know when enemies are nearby you. And I just, I did this stupid little hack where I was like, oh, I'm just gonna add these notes to the world and I'm gonna give them the same properties as the swarm so that your radar looks like there's 500 of these things even though we can only really have like five or six at a time. And so I created this little gimmick on the radar and it was like really cheap. But like when the Capcom representatives played it and they saw that they were like so happy and like they thought it was like so cool. And in my mind, I didn't want to tell like, oh, this is just a quick little thing. But like it was a reward for being stuck somewhere where like, Larry, you only get like five enemies, but the moment is calling for 500 and you got to make it work somehow. And like I just just tried to find a creative way to bridge that gap and it worked. And I'll never forget that moment because it reminded me to double down on your creativity when problem solving. And I never let go of that. I always say like, I don't care if we can't. Can't just means not the ideal way, but not impossible. And so that's that's kind of my philosophy in problem solving moving forward. Working with very little and making a lot. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Larry. That was, um, I mean, I think this was an amazing hour. Thank you so much for taking the time. We know you are super duper busy. Um, you are inspirational. And it's just amazing to see you grow from where you where you started from where you are now. Oh, so um, as you can see by the comments, everyone's saying thank you so much. Uh, yeah, hopefully yeah. that inspired all of you guys to uh, think about game designing as a career. It is a competitive field, but it's also extremely rewarding. After all, you know, we all love to play games. So <laughs> thank you again. Have a wonderful right. evening. Thank you so much, Larry. Appreciate it. Right, thank you, everybody. And have a great one. Good luck, everyone.